Tonight, new commercial rules for drones you might not like. Netflix's big push into Asia and the spine malware that was released worldwide. Yay! Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 222, Palindrome, woo, for Monday, November 24th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy with free step-by-step -step repair guides, high-quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to iFixit.com slash twit and enter the code TN2 at checkout. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Lane. Happy Monday. Let's get right into today's tech feed. Security researchers at Symantec have published a report today that they have discovered a type of malware currently loose in the world that's being used to spy on internet service and telecommunications companies and probably created by a government agency, possibly inside the U.S. or Israel or China. The team calls this Trojan region and they describe it as a complex piece of malware whose structure displays a degree of technical competence rarely seen that's probably why they think it's government government work the tool also has a quote extensive range of capabilities that provides the people controlling it with a powerful framework for mass surveillance the researchers said region has been used in an ongoing spying operation that started back in 2008 stopped in 2011 and then started back up last year. About 100 region infections have been detected, the researchers said, with 52% centered in Russia and Saudi Arabia. The remainder have occurred in Mexico, Ireland, India, Afghanistan, Iran, Belgium, Austria, and Pakistan. Although no infections have been detected yet in the U.S. or China. I don't know. Happy Monday, everybody. Would you like to fly a commercial drone? Lots of people would, but you might need a license and you might need to limit flights to daylight hours and you might have to fly below 400 feet and within sight of the person at the controls, according to people familiar with the Federal Aviation Administration or FAA's plans that spoke to the Wall Street Journal. The drone industry has been waiting on commercial rules for about six years now, which would cover rules for drone use in industries like farming and filmmaking and construction, all based as commercial. Current FAA policy allows recreational drone flights in the U.S., but pretty much bars drones from all commercial use, with some exceptions, case-by-case -case stuff. The agency also plans to group drones weighing less than 55 pounds under a single set of rules, and pilot certifications would reportedly require dozens of hours of flying manned aircraft. FAA officials expect to announce proposed rules by year-end, which would be followed by a public comment period before issuing final rules, which might take a couple years. So what is going on with Apple's iCloud anyway? The company is having problems rolling out its iCloud photo library, people familiar with the operation tell the information, because of Apple's internal structure, which sources say is because Apple doesn't really have a centralized team working on core cloud infrastructure. That's probably a bad thing. iCloud Photo Library is designed to tap into a new Photos application for OS X Yosemite. It was announced by Apple earlier this year. But it isn't going to be ready until early 2015, which not only missed Yosemite's launch, but also the launch of iOS 8 back in September, too. Doesn't really seem very seamless. Last week, iCloud.com users got the ability to upload images to their photo library. Although support remains limited to JPEG files only, not other types of images and not videos either for uploading. Steve Jobs first introduced iCloud back in 2011 as a big improvement over its predecessor, Mobile Me. Remember Mobile Me? At the time, Jobs said well, Mobile Me was not really Apple's finest hour. But the company hasn't provided an update on the total number of iCloud accounts since mid-2013 when it said that there were 300 million active users. Get it together, Apple, please, because I like iCloud. Joining me now is Seamus Byrne, the editor of Australia and Asia for CNET. We're going to talk a little bit about Netflix. Hi, Seamus. Hey, how you doing? Well, I'm doing really well. Thanks for coming back on the show. Uh, it's been about a month now. So we heard recently that Netflix announced that it would launch in Australia in March. Uh, is this is this just Australia? Is it is it part of a you know a bigger push into to other areas of the world? How far does this go? Yeah, so it is. It's a it's part of a, a wider push uh, beyond America, basically, and uh, and launching a lot more into Europe. They've already been in the UK, but but starting to hit some mainland European countries as well as Australia and New Zealand. And some of the talk is that the Australian base will then be used 
as part of their push into the rest of Asia and into much of the uh, you know high population lucrative uh, markets around Asia at the moment. But uh, uh, so we've we've known that the rumours have been out there about them uh, coming into the Australian market in particular for quite a while. Uh, and the big shift really now is that it's finally an official thing. It's not just the the quiet murmuring of people in the industry. Now, of course, living in the U.S., I've been a Netflix subscriber for some time now, and it's it's easy to forget that it isn't just available all over other parts of the world. Does Australia have anything similar to Netflix now, where Netflix would be coming in and competing with 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 a with a big player already? Yeah, look, there's well, <laughs> there's no big players at the moment. Uh, what we have had so far is a company that's been around for quite a long time that did basically model itself on Netflix a long time ago. It's called Quick Flix, uh, and uh, basically it it followed the same model of having a DVD by mail kind of service and then started to roll in uh, a digital subscription service as well. But it has a very limited selection. So it doesn't do uh, really good sort of HD type streams. Uh, and then we have sort of other services from uh, the other sorts of telco players. So, you know, the companies like uh, Telstra, uh, which is one of our sort of, you know, biggest telecommunications companies here. Um, but then Foxtel, we have this situation here where we only have one cable company in the whole country. So a monopoly cable company. And we've only ever had a penetration of about 30% when it comes to cable TV here in Australia. So it's a really kind of small thing here. And, uh, and it does mean that people's appetite for digital is quite huge. And of course, we've been noted as one of the biggest piracy company uh, countries in the world because in a lot of ways it's very hard for people to get easy access to digital content and and one thing about Netflix already is that uh, estimates are as many as 50,000 Australian users already use the American service by using uh, VPNs things like that to be able to actually stream directly from the US service and pretend they're American. So you mentioned Foxtel the only cable company that you have to choose from so I guess it makes choice a lot easier. Although, you know, in, in, in my part of the U.S., I only have one choice as well, although Comcast isn't the only, uh, is, isn't the, only provider in the entire country. But how does, um, how does the broadband situation factor in Australia? With, with Netflix, obviously, we've got net neutrality issues in the U.S. that we're, our government is currently trying to figure out, uh, hopefully, uh, to, to, to make the most of things for consumers. But would we, do we... Do you have broadband bandwidth issues? You know, are there throttling concerns? What's the what's the uh, the situation with Foxtel? Um, yeah, so the, probably the one issue is just just pure speed, basically, to keep up with what an HD stream really wants from you. So you know, we've just had a, a big debate over the last few years where uh, one government was actually planning on rolling out a, a massive new fibre network. Uh, that would deliver fibre to the home of you know, almost all houses in Australia and, and essentially start delivering 100 megabit internet. And now Australia is the size of America in terms of landmass. So, uh, you know, it's pretty. it was a pretty huge idea. That's essentially just been killed off as an idea when we had a change of government. And, uh, and now they're rolling out a service uh, based around sort of a different fibre technology. But, but it's still a little bit more ADSL centric here in Australia. And, and so that does mean that most people's speeds are probably anywhere from, you know, one megabit to, you know, to 20 megabit if you're having a really good day. Uh, and that does mean that when it comes to a service like Netflix, being able to deliver HD, and, and they're saying they're going to offer 4K streams here in Australia as well, but it's going to be very few users here in Australia who will be able to actually enjoy a 4K stream um, just because we don't really have the setup here for mm. that kind of sustained traffic. What about rights and licensing? Uh, you know, Netflix can be can seem a little hit and miss uh, with its with its collection, and obviously licensing rights are, are a huge part of why certain shows don't appear or or, or appear years later. It, what's the what's the, what's the library going to be like in Australia? Yeah, this is, uh, I, I think one thing that we've already sort of seen here is that, you know, Australians do kind of love uh, Netflix in concept or the people who are already using it are like, great, you know, I want the same service here in Australia. But but once it comes to Australia, it has to play by the Australian licensing rules. And, and a, a great example is that Netflix actually doesn't even hold the Australian rights to some of its own original programming 
because it's licensed to those shows to Foxtel, our cable company here. So when it launches in Australia, it might not even have House of Cards or it might not have, you know, the latest season. But of, that's of, the of, only oh. reason to have Netflix <laughs> at this point. Not really. Not not the only reason, but it's, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons I think people sign up for it is, is, is the original programming. That would be so yeah, weird not to have that. Yeah, so I think alongside that, the fact that we then also have, um, you know, like one of the things that we have heard is I think they, you know, they're playing this for the long game, right? You know, they, when they come into Australia, they're gonna they're gonna aim to not necessarily win in 2015, but we've we've already seen that they've secured the digital streaming rights to, of course, you know, one of the great shows right now, Gotham, um, which I don't. It's not doing that well, is it? But anyway, I, I think- don't. I don't watch it, but I, there are definitely some Gotham faithfuls in my yeah in my, in my friend group. <laughs> so yeah, so they've secured the rights to that, but that won't start streaming on their service until like 2016 or something. But it kind of demonstrates that they're playing for the fact that over the long run, they have the size, they've got the US relationships in place, they're going to be able to start buying a lot more global license deals off the back of their US connections to be able to say, well, we will just start accumulating more and more shows so that maybe not next year. You know, I think there will be a lot of gaps in their library next year and people will be a bit frustrated. It'll probably cost more money here in Australia than it does in the US as well. Mm. Uh, and and I think we kind of know that they're probably going to end up having to cut off Australians who are paying um, to use the American US service. Uh, you know, we've sort of heard a lot of rumblings that license holders are saying, look, you've had your fun letting people use the American version, but if you're going to launch in Australia, you now have to play by the rules and start not accepting Australian credit cards on your US store and, and things like that. So I think it'll be frustrating for a while, but eventually, you know, I don't think they're, they're not here for the short term. Well, nobody said that cord cutting was easy now, did they? Seamus Byrne edits for Australia and Asia for CNET. It's a pretty big territory you have there. Thanks so much for being with us, Seamus Byrne. And before you go, remind folks where they can keep up with your work. Yes, uh, find me on CNET.com and at Seamus on Twitter. Excellent. Thanks so much, Seamus. Cheers. Coming up, some former Tinder employees are launching a new app to take on Tinder. And some of the, well, let's just call them dumbest tech gifts found in the Sky Mall magazine. Oh, some of them are quite dumb. But first, let's thank, let's thank iFixit for sponsoring this episode of TN2. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy with free step-by-step -step repair guides, high-quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll need to fix stuff yourself. In fact, for $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, just go to ifixit.com slash twit and enter the code TN2, that's TN and the number two, at checkout. Okay, so it's the holiday season. You might know somebody who's just, they love the DIY thing, they love tools. The iFixit Pro Tech Toolkit is the perfect gift. It has 70 tools to assist with mods or or, or a gadget that's malfunctioning or or if any sort of issue might come your way. It includes iFixit's 54-bit driver kit that has standard and specialty and security bits. Also, things like precision tweezers and an anti-static wrist strap and opening tools. So you could open up, you know, your your your, your smartphone or, or a notebook that has some sort of a weird fan problem or a tablet or a game console. I mean, really anything. That's, that is what the tech toolkit is designed for. It's very lightweight. It's compact. It's well-made. It's very durable. And it's, again, for somebody who kind of likes to do it yourself, but but even the FBI uses these toolkits. The ProTech toolkit is used by computer and smartphone repair technicians everywhere as well. You know if they've got it, this is what you need as well. iFixit has something for every hacker and geek on your holiday list this year. For more information, head over to ifixit.com slash twit for the ProTech Toolkit and other holiday deals. And then enter the code TN2 at checkout and you will save $10 off any purchase of $50 or more. That's ifixit.com slash twit and thanks to iFixit for their support of TN2. On to a few more stories that we're following today. ESPN is getting ready to sell streaming video subscriptions for sports programming next year without requiring viewers to pay for cable TV, starting with cricket. Yes, Recode reports that ESPN will sell U.S. viewers live digital access to the Cricket World Cup. That begins in February. And, you know, it's, it's, at least in the U.S., it's not our biggest sport, but the tournament is only held every four years, and it's a huge sporting event. This would be the first time that ESPN has broken out of the pay TV bundle as well. It is unclear how much consumers would be charged for the games or which games would actually be included in the package. For now, ESPN has declined to comment. 
Whitney Wolf was an early employee at Tinder who actually sued the company for sexual harassment and workplace discrimination, no longer with the company, and has now launched a direct competitor to Tinder called Bumble with a couple other ex-Tinder employees. Anonymous sources are telling TechCrunch. Now, the app has a Facebook page which describes Bumble as a social discovery app that promotes a safe and respectful community where you'll never get unwanted messages and your suggestions would be more relevant than what they call dead-end matches that you find on the more shallow apps. I mean, they're not talking about Tinder specifically, but they're kind of talking about Tinder specifically, aren't they? The Bumble app had a public Instagram account that showed a preview video of the app, which showed a user making a match and then chatting with somebody else. That account has since gone private, although according to other social posts, Bumble is slated to launch on December 1st. We'll be swiping right. So they'll probably call it something else. Workplace communication tool Slack. Do you use it? A lot of companies do these days. Uh, the company's announced today that it'll begin selling a new tier of service starting in January that's aimed at larger enterprises. And this tool is called Slack Plus. However, it's important to point out that companies that subscribe to the Plus plan will be able to request every message that employees have sent on the service from that point forward, which includes direct messages to coworkers, that's usually indicating a private conversation, and then also a history of any changes that are made to messages between employees, kind of a revision history. Now, this is a manager's dream, but possibly an employee's, uh, employee's nightmare, right? So Slack has also revised its privacy policy to accommodate the new feature, which it says was requested by businesses that are legally obligated to retain employee communications. Slack launched in February and now has 300,000 daily users on 40,000 teams and is used at large companies like Amazon and Walmart and ESPN. ESPN, back in the news again, twice in one day. Finally, it's a big week for plane travel. The U.S. Thanksgiving holiday is right around the corner. Three days from now, oh gosh. Which means that a lot of you will be flipping through Sky Mall catalogs while you sit cramped in coach waiting for your Bloody Mary. In the holiday spirit, Gizmodo has put together a list of the dumbest things, their words, not mine, that you can buy in a Sky Mall catalog, which includes some gems like the Serenity Cat Pod. That retails for $1,000. What a steal. Also, an Alpha Fusion personal sauna system. That goes for $16,000, and it heats your body in a sauna pod. We've also got some canvas art that says, Hug it out. A device that looks like it was made in 1987 that it's designed to hold your passwords. Yep, that's what it does. Passwords for other places. You actually need a password to access your passwords, and it looks like that. And we even have a laptop beverage holder. Yep, there it is. Actually, you know, I'll be honest, with the exception of the password device, I actually like all of these SkyMall options, so please buy them for me. I've been very good. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Thanks so much for being here. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can watch live every day at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And of course, don't miss our morning news offering, Tech News Today, which is every day, Monday through Friday, at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.